everyone. I think we're going to get started. So welcome. Uh, thank you so much for coming out to DOPE 2020. <laughs> I'm Olivia Meyer, and I'm a second year master's student in the Department of Geography here at the University of Kentucky. And I'm also your conference chair. I am thrilled to see everyone here today and to share ideas, network, and celebrate the 10th anniversary of DOPE. My co-organizers and I are so excited to see this conference come to fruition. This is a completely graduate student-run conference, which is something we do on top of seminars, teaching, and research. And grading, dealing with administrative bureaucracy, reading, you get the idea. So we are especially proud of pulling off this conference of over 400 registrants. Uh, I now want to shout out our core organizers, Jonghee Calderaro, Jordan McRae, Corinne Turkowicz, Lindsay Funky, Pasama Colquelli, Katie Loosecamp, Karen Kinslow, Zina Merkin, Jed De Bruin, Jack Swab, Dayton Swarns, Emra Ozel, and Helen Richardson. So if you could raise your hand or stand if you're able to be recognized, let's all give them a hand. <laughs> all right. We're thrilled to welcome you all here, and none of this would be possible without everyone here today. So thank you so much for being a part of this. We're also very grateful to our donors, including the Appalachian Center, the Lewis Honors College, the International Center, the Committee on Social Theory, the Departments of Entomology, Landscape Architecture, Anthropology, and Geography, the Student Sustainability Council, the College of Agriculture, the Cultural and Political Ecology Specialty Group of the AEG, and our keynote sponsor, the Year of Equity Program. Let's also give them a hand. Because of our sponsors as well as your support, we were able to bring together an incredible group of speakers and sessions. Our overall vision for the 10th anniversary of DOPE is to consider where political ecology has brought us, where we need to go, and how political ecology can get us there. Our organizing collective is concerned not just with critique, but how we might deconstruct oppressive systems and strive towards liberation. How can we use political ecology as a lens mobilized towards action and change? At the 10th anniversary of DOPE, we understand understanding the past, engaging in the present, and envisioning the future of political ecology is a fitting theme. As an experiment, uh, could I have you raise your hand if you attended the first ever DOPE? Okay, I think you definitely need to clap for that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> It's amazing that this student-run conference has lasted 10 years, and as hard as generations of the UK Political Ecology Working Group have worked to get this conference off the ground, it's all of you, the folks who come from across the country and the world to make this conference special, that make this conference special. We're all inspired by the work that this community is doing, and I know that this welcome address will serve as an incredible departure point for these conversations. I hope you enjoy DOPE 10, the connections you make, and the conversations that you have with others. So I'd now like to introduce Dr. Nare Seninyayaka, an assistant professor in geography who will be doing the introduction for Dr. Rebecca Elmhurst. Nare's work incorporates health environment geographies and feminist scholarship to study the politics of knowledge, science, and expertise. She considers how people experience, know, and govern health risks related to kidney disease in Sri Lanka and how these processes shape the production of subjectivities, bodies, and everyday practices of resource use. Please give a warm welcome to Nari. Um, okay, well, I'm incredibly honored uh, to introduce and welcome Dr. Rebecca Elmhurst as one of the keynote speakers for the dimension, uh, Dimensions of Political Ecology Conference this afternoon. Dr. Elmhurst is a reader in human geography and the deputy head of the School of Environment and Technology at the University of Brighton in the United Kingdom. I was first introduced to Rebecca's work as a master's student where we read selections from the special issue in Geoforum on feminist political ecology. 
And I'm sure and have no doubt that many of you in this room um, have also, uh, are also familiar with this piece. At the time, um, I didn't actually have a language to articulate uh, the kind of research that I wanted to do, but I ve remember very clearly um, finding her work to be energizing and inspiring, um, and so I'm especially honored to be introducing her today. Uh, so Rebecca is trained as a human geographer and a political ecologist with two decades of research and teaching experience on struggles over environmental governance, migration, social justice uh, in the Global South. Uh, she is perhaps most cited uh, for her work redefining and advancing the field of feminist political ecology. But she's also written widely on diverse topics such as migration, sustainability, forestry, and flooding. A lot of her work also involves uh, collaborative partnerships with scholar activists, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. Uh, and this includes current projects on the gender dimension of oil palm investment in, in Indonesia, the links between uh, migrant remittances and livelihood and resource access, and also experiences of living with floods in a mobile South Asia as well. Uh, in all, Rebecca has published more than 40 uh, journal articles and chapters, uh, co-edited three books, uh, and contributed to several popular publications as well. Her research has been funded by many prestigious institutions, uh, including the Economic and Social Research Council, the British Academy, uh, and also the European Commission. Uh, so today she will be presenting a talk titled Beyond the Handbook, Pluralizing the Practice of Feminist Political Ecology. So in this presentation, Dr. Elmh Elmhurst will discuss the ways in which feminist political ecology functions as an increasingly pluralized set of knowledges and practices. Her talk will focus on the edges uh, or boundaries of academic feminist political ecology, where seepages from feminist and environmental justice movements and ch challenges from professionalized gender and development work are changing the kinds of questions being asked and the ways in which we do our work. In doing so, she will reflect on what this might mean for political ecology as a discipline writ, la writ large um, and also its pedagogies within the academy. Um, so please join me in welcoming D Dr. Elmhurst for what I am sure will be uh, a dope presentation. much uh, for that really um, warm welcome and um, I, I really hope I can live up to uh, the, the uh, introduction that, that I've been given. Um, it's really more than an honor to be here at the 10th anniversary of uh, the 10th di Dimensions of Political Ecology annual meeting and I'd really like to thank the organizers as you all have done already for all the hard work that's gone into putting together such a fantastic program. I've, I've just been through the, the um, titles. I haven't had chance, to obviously, to, to engage yet, but I'm really looking forward to, to doing so. Um, it feels very much like uh, a kind of a real spirit that, that you've managed to maintain over these 10 years with this conference that I think is probably unique and certainly not replicated in some of the bigger conferences where you know, the whole, the whole gig seems to be about finding a job. This, is, this feels to me like an authentic and an honest meeting, and that's the spirit in which I'm, I'm coming to, to talk to you about um, some of the, the sort of dilemmas and interesting departures that I see happening in, in feminist political ecology. Um, so much has been happening in political ecology and feminist political ecology in those, in those intervening 10 years. Um, really changing uh, our kind of how we might frame political ecology and the title of my uh, talk there around the handbook tyrannies. I took tyrannies out because it felt a little strong, but I do sen sense sometimes that these handbooks can feel a little bit tyrannical about in terms of the what they include and what they don't include and what they can eclipse. So I'm keeping that in inverted commas, so uh, bear with me on that. But what I'm really interested in is this whole notion of pluralizing the practice of feminist political ecology in all sorts of ways. And perhaps looking, tracking some of the pathways in which this is unfolding in, in my own work, um, but hopefully making some connections with some of the things that, that you're, you're all doing and or you're all engaging in. And there's very much a kind of underpinning dilemma about what happens to us as, as researchers, as scholar activists, 
um, once the kind of phase of masters and PhD is over, what 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 happens next? And so some of this I hope will be ringing some bells around around that that for you for you as well. Um, I'm imagining all of you are sort of positioned rather differently to that to that kind of dynamic, but um, it's something that I that I feel very strongly about in my in my role as a, a in pedagogy. I come from a university that's very much a kind of teaching focused university. And so my engagements with research often come with that in mind. And the real challenging questions that undergraduates ask that can really keep you on your toes. So um, I'm going to um, sort of uh, start by sort of thinking a little bit about um, the whole ways in which you can pluralize feminist political ecology. Um, but some of the ways in which that I've, I've um, been trying to to kind of work with uh, feminist political ecology and the sort of framings that I've, that I've come to in, in, in all of that. So I'm going to um, start really by, uh, I guess, a little bit of taking stock in terms of, of feminist political ecology, uh, but with a, with a kind of sense in which sometimes that taking stock can be quite troubling. Um, Rather than present a kind of handbook stock take of currents in feminist political ecology and leave it at that, what I'm going to do is sort of augment this by really pressing at the, the boundaries, the edges and the boundaries of this subdiscipline, and particularly around the doing of feminist political ecology. So my talk is quite self-reflexive, and I present a, a quite a, a sort of situated account of feminist political ecology in terms of my own complicity in framing. Um, it was mentioned in the introduction how uh, the, that special issue kind of took on a little bit of a life of its own, uh, and in particular the introduction, which um, was really my take on, on feminist political e ecology and my route into that, that particular area. So um, with that... Um, with that question, I, I was really sort of interested in, in sort of decanonizing feminist political ecology and thinking about its, its pluralities, what we might include within um, feminist political ecology and what we might not. So some of the discussion that I had in that article was really about almost claiming research that hadn't labeled itself as feminist political ecology and giving it that label to see where that went and see what, what that would would do um, in terms of pushing uh, pushing a, a subfield that I felt was being a little neglected in in terms of the canon of, of political ecology more generally. That move um, inspired, um, it in some ways, was was um, a little bit of a of something that really needed undoing uh, because of the way that 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 my kind of complicity in writing feminist political ecology in that kind of a way um, lacked the reflexivity that I think it really needed, which was to kind of really note and claim and be transparent about my route into feminist political ecology, where I came from, how I situated myself in relation to my work in, um, particularly in gender and development studies ahead of that, and my engagement with feminist geography, which I think gave me a particular kind of set of questions that I felt were important, a particular set of issues that I flagged in terms of my, my sort of the work that I cited with, within, that, within that framing, which I found useful. For me, it was useful. But what it did was it tended to eclipse out some other kind of currents of feminist political ecology that I, I was less aware of at, at that point in time. So one of the things I've been really interested in, in looking at and, and seeing happen um, is through my, my sort of the breadth of engagements and the widening of my networks over time has been uh, to sort of identify these different kinds of um, routes into feminist political ecology that are, that are becoming all the more visible within sort of mainstream academic work, but I think really challenging and bringing, bringing some new, new perspectives in, some of which are actually old perspectives that have had quite a long, a long sort of track history, but perhaps haven't had the, the sort of um, 
the import that it within political ecology that, that maybe they deserve. So um, I get one of the one of the th um, interesting things for me has been seeing how differently people are different people situated differently in relation to political ecology are narrating feminist political ecology from different networked positions. Um, as highlighted, for example, in the recent editor collection uh, by Wendy Harcourt and Ingrid Nelson, which I think gives greater emphasis to feminist political ecology as a process of doing environmentalism, justice and feminism differently. It's a really different kind of way of, of thinking to the ways in which um, I, would, I would sort of cast feminist political ecology at the time when I began writing, writing that work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that engagement for me personally has done, situating myself and, and rerouting my networks, um, and how this has helped me to sort of start to see some of the, the really productive ways in which this kind of work in, political ecology, in feminist political ecology can unfold. But then I'm going to bring us back to think about how even when we start to emphasize some of these roots via environmental and social justice movements, uh, there's, a, there's a troublesome problem with perhaps losing sight of a very important site in which feminist political ecology is practiced, and that is within sort of international environment and development organizations. And that's a problem because it's precisely in those kinds of sites that there's a huge and growing demand for so-called gender experts. And often those sorts of people are being recruited from feminist political ecology, not always, but sometimes. And I'm really interested to sort of trouble that and perhaps explore that relationship um, a little bit more carefully. So to do this, I've been involved recently with a new kind of co-writing project with Bernadette Resurrection, who's based in Bangkok with the uh, Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, and she's really very much work, working at this sort of sharp end between science, policy, and feminist theory. And what we've done is kind of engaged her networks mostly, some of my networks, to kind of talk to people who are inhabiting this slot of gender expert in those organizations. Looking at their biographies, the ways that they've come from feminist political ecology into those kinds of settings, or perhaps are working with ideas that, have, um, that are claimed from feminist political ecology, and what that means, what happens when those ideas land in these very technical um, institutions with um, very sort of positivist, often very positivist logics. But to do that with a, by sort of rather than um, researching on those people is to kind of was to write with those people. So I'm going to talk in my, in, in my presentation a little bit about some of that work. It's still a little bit emerging. We've not quite finished the project, but there's some, I think, some interesting, interesting themes coming out from, from that. But what I want to do with that, which is not really so much what we've been doing in, in the um, research itself, is speak back to feminist political ecology from that site as with this sort of idea of speaking back to feminist political ecology in order to kind of stay with the trouble in a really important sense, um, given that these organizations have a lot of agency, a lot of power, and are, are shaping, shaping things in, in, um, in very concrete ways. So um, I mentioned just now in my, in my sort of rather lengthy introduction about visibilizing feminist political ecology and how important these kinds of stock takes have been in terms of accomplishing that. But they come with a danger in that there's a, there's a certain amount of erasure that goes on. Uh, they're very much, it's about these, these hand, uh, handbook entries necessarily give this kind of privileged and partial perspective. And this matters. So it matters that we're, we're kind of honest about where these different kinds of perspectives are coming from. Uh, and it matters uh, a little bit to see what, what they capture and what they leave out. And I think I, I have a very personal stake in that, in, in seeing how um, some of the ways that I've tried to, to frame feminist political ecology have been important for some people, but then for others, they uh, have really kind of missed some very crucial things that have been going on 
in, in other aspects of what we might call feminist political ecology. These handbook entries, uh, uh, they really kind of took on a bit of a life of their own. I, I, I don't know if they really featured quite so much here in the US, but certainly in the UK, they've kind of been one of the ways in which um, publishers have kind of uh, dragooning people into, into kind of creating knowledge and packaging it in particular kinds of ways um, for this burgeoning uh, market of marketized undergraduates. So there's, uh, there's some issues, I think, around around the whole kind of notion of, of writing in, in that kind of a way. And more than once I've had to ask myself, well, wh what are these things for? Um, but perhaps one uh, a kind of more important question is, is to ask whether feminist political ecology is itself a canon. Can we talk about it as a kind of canon of knowledge? Should it be a canon of knowledge? And um, one of the things I think that's really striking about feminist political ecology is the sort of disputed way, uh, disputes around what kinds of concepts and enduring practices really kind of can be claimed by feminist political ecology as a whole. Are there certain concepts that are unique to feminist political ecology or not? Does it matter that there aren't? Um, but it, unlike some of the kind of, some other disciplines where um, I've said, uh, DWM, some of you might know what I'm referring to then, so certain disciplines where their knowledge is very much associated with particular individuals, I would say that's not the case for feminist political ecology and that's, that's really its strength. But what are these concepts and practices that, that are often the kind of driver for defining feminist political ecology, how widely are they shared? Is there such a thing as a feminist political ecology epistemic community. So I've just, um, one of the ways of kind of thinking about this is to think about the different kinds of mappings of feminist political ecology. So I think it's kind of interesting that I've moved from a mapping of feminist political ecology to thinking about how are different people mapping feminist political ecology which says something about the maturity of this area, that it, it, has, it can embrace these multiple and situated perspectives that very much reflect these roots um, and roots into feminist political ecology work. And I've been really um, drawn to the, the framing of this that was um, provided by uh, Diane Rochelo and, and Robin Roth and published more recently in a, in a reflective piece with multi-authored reflective piece um, by Cantor et al., uh, which I thought was really a really nice way of sort of thinking about these rooted networks. And they use the, the term rooted networks to accomplish a number of different things. But for me, um, one of the things that I think is useful is to think about the networks through which feminist political ecology knowledge is produced and to really be kind of... Um, honest and precise about the situatedness and power dynamics, I suppose, of these rooted networks. And there are some really nice, uh, some examples of these different situated mappings. So starting from the one that I think I would align myself with a little here, um, the mapping which I, I undertook that was very much coming from critical development studies via feminist geography, transnational connections with feminists and activists in agrarian and forest organizations. So I see myself in that, in that kind of a mapping. And there may be one or two others that, that perhaps share a similar kind of mapping who I also have worked with closely in, in various capacities. But then there's another kind of mapping that, that is ongoing. Uh, and this is a kind of mapping coming from a, a feminist political ecology that's being written from ecofeminism and degrowth agendas. And this is the, the sort of mapping that was begun in some ways um, at least or at least sort of brought to the table with a feminist political ecology label by, um, among others, when Wendy Harcourt uh, to talk about this process of doing environmentalism, justice and feminism differently. And that has opened up a whole new set of questions, a whole new set of, um, a whole new set of I guess alignments and political agendas in some ways that that perhaps earlier forms of other forms of political ecology like the one that I've been involved with we had sort of not engaged with the ecofeminism had particular kinds of associations but 
uh, that I think this new kind of mapping issues and certainly manages to sort of w w um, move move to one side. Then there is the um, feminist political ecology, which I think has been incredibly important in bringing us uh, bringing into view more clearly and, and centralizing anti-racist and decolonial politics within uh, feminist political ecology, a need that, that matters more than, more than ever and should have mattered a long time ago. But it's, it's something that I think is you can really see the work coming from that angle, um, mushrooming and really pushing, pushing the, um, what is feminist political ecology in all sorts of different and new and, and, and important ways. And then I would add to that another kind of mappings, other mappings that often slip out of get out of our view uh, for those of us that are relatively monolingual. Uh, so uh, mappings coming from outside the Anglophone world um, and that from outside North American um, and UK academic uh, political ecology. And to this, I think uh, many of you might have come across um, undisciplined environments, what used to be the entitled network, and how that has by calling itself undisciplined environments, this um, network of political ecologists um, from all, all parts of the world uh, very much is about decentering the canonizing of political ecology more broadly, and within that, feminist political ecology too, um, really decentering what, what can be claimed as political ecology in really important ways. So with the, um, the network that of um, undisciplined environments, which you might uh, be familiar with their, their website and their blogs and, and so forth, it's a really uh, vibrant community of people really uh, speaking um, about a lot of political ecology kinds of questions, sometimes feminist political ecology kinds of questions. Um, one of the things that I've been involved in recently is a, is a new similarly funded kind of network. So these networks start off with very generous European funding that funds um, a kind of training network of PhD students in, in working closely with um, mentors in various parts of the world with the idea of um, bringing, pushing scholarship forward, but also they're very much envisaged by the European Commission as a training network. And I'm fortunate to be part of, of one of these networks that's actually been the brainchild of a, num a group of people who really wanted to pull together a lot of these different imaginings of politically, uh, feminist political ecology and see what happened when he brought them all together. So the way this uh, we go is working and um, the, the project itself had a different title that then everybody argued about. So now the acronym doesn't fit the title, but anyway, let's, let's um, move with this. So um, it's uh, our, our project, the Innovative Training Network is entitled Wellbeing, Ecology, Gender and Community. And just in those words, you can start to get a sense of the kind of political ecology, feminist political ecology that's being imagined and conjured through that network. So it involves um, mentors, PhD supervisors located in various European universities and the strictures of European funding means that they have to be in European universities. And I just managed to kind of slip through the net before that um, the, the wall came down as it were uh, on that. So lucky me. Uh, but the, uh, the supervisors are um, work with also with partners from outside of the EU and we very deliberately um, worked hard to make sure that we were including partners from all different parts of the world um, who would be able to kind of inform and play a, an important role in this in this network. So but this was a kind of networking the project development itself was, a reflexively rooted network coming from these different sort of points uh, where we all sort of brought in our different networks to kind of make this kind of meta network almost. Um, and the idea was through this, this um, PhD students would get the benefits of this kind of networking, uh, working relationally on PhDs. So rather than this being an individualized endeavor, it's very much about doing feminist political ecology training differently. 
we've worked very hard to try and establish a kind of politics and ethics of network of the network of doing feminist political ecology otherwise so the network has been very much informed by some social movement practices around well-being and care within the network and trying to kind of work against an academia that really punishes and and can kind of undermine some of those more collective types of activities it's not i can't say that we've necessarily succeeded in that but that's certainly been the the aspiration however one of the things uh, there's obviously a lot quite within this network quite a lot of things that are um, perhaps stand in conflict to that in some ways and one of the the issues is that this is very much a training network mandate so how we how we need to kind of think of that is uh, and one of the ways we're being pushed to think about that is to think about how we embrace feminist political ecology as a body of knowledge and as an epistemic community so what what do people need to know to come out of this program as feminist political ecologists well you can see from the logos the number of organizations there and that's probably the number of different views on how to handle this that, that came have come out through our discussions. But what we've been really what what I've really felt in my reflections on this whole process of working through networks and doing political feminist political ecology relationally in this kind of a way is the real sort of agentic force of pedagogy which encourages us to kind of map out debates in in very particular ways and what that can then mean what that can then do and what that can then obscure as well so it's not been straightforward but we've kind of settled on a number of themes within within this network and the reason i'm kind of presenting these is to just kind of give you a sense of what sorts of things we're doing it's basically everything um, but um, just to kind of summarize i think what that what it does do is sort of reflect some of those handbook entry situated descriptions of feminist political ecology that I mentioned earlier. So very much a, um, a theme around the impacts of and responses to the logics of extractivism and enclosure. So that's very close to, to my heart and the kind of work that I've done or tried to do um, with my, my kind of feminist political ecology. But what, we've, uh, what the network has enabled us to do is to sort of bring in some new kinds of questions around bringing body and community emotion and affect into those kinds of debates linking up with questions around gendered and plural ontologies values attached to non-human natures uh, and those sort of intersecting power dynamics around the politics of access and, ex and exclusion so some of those those things have been brought into view by the kind of inter interacting of these different situated networks and that to me has been incredibly powerful then another theme within our, our, uh, the, the sort of PhD research that's going on is around sufficiency and degrowth, commoning and a feminist ethics of care. And here we're really drawing some connections between um, situated concepts such as social reproduction and some of the work that's been done in, in geography actually around community economies and politics of place. Um, often the kind of motive for, for that amongst the the people who came as phd students was living in austerity situations in europe um, some of the commoning practices that have emerged around that but then looking at, at slightly more more kind of intentional communities as well that are trying to sort of live otherwise in in this this kind of a way um, not only in the global south but in the global north as well so really changing the sort of geographies of feminist political ecology i think in some really exciting ways and then the third area or theme of engagement has been with decolonial feminist political ecology. And within the network, <laughs> some, some people who've been really at the forefront of, of pushing decolonial thinking um, in and from Latin America, um, from indigenous places as well, and bringing some of those ideas to bear um, to really challenge sort of universalizing claims that are very much subordinating other modes of knowing. So how we can try and connect all those those three areas is obviously um, a challenge for, for us um, within within this network. I raise this because it all looks kind of nice and neat and tidy when it's there in bullet points on a on a slide. But 
the complexities and the headaches and the, the kind of um, debates and sometimes tears that have gone on in, in terms of um, trying to kind of work with, with these ideas, get them, make them work together in, in ways that can says something also about some of the dangers of networks and the dangers of networks that can make you feel crushed a little bit, can make you feel that you're not, uh, other everybody else seems to be doing fine and you're just kind of uh, kind of beavering away trying to figure these things out and some everybody else seems to know what they're talking about. So there can be some real dilemmas within networks and I'm enough of a feminist geographer to know that networks are about power and so that's also been a piece of work for all of us within the network is to try and challenge some of those the sort of negatives and downsides of those of those sort of networked practices that relationality is 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 complex and it involves some of these power dynamics as well so bringing feminist political ecology lens to even our practices of how we work is obviously um, an important aspect of this so some of the um, productive tensions that we've that we've kind of experienced and that I'd like to share with you a little bit is the kind of undisciplining that we're trying to maintain whilst redisciplining. So, so there's some real productive tensions around that. Is there such a thing as a feminist political ecology analysis? You see this quite often in journal articles. I've done it myself, I'm sure, where people might introduce their work by saying, I'm using a feminist political ecology analysis. And what we've discussed in our network is how that subclause needs something else. What is that? What is a, a feminist political ecology analysis? And is it necessary or should we begin to start to unravel and, and unpack what exactly that means? Do we need to have something that we can kind of put a stamp on and say, yeah, I get that, that's a feminist political ecology analysis. So within our project teams, everybody has very different intellectual roots in the academic turf of community economies, science technology studies from specific social movements. And all of these are kind of troubling how what we might decide could be in a feminist political ecology analysis. So what we can see very specifically in, in, and in kind of troubling some of those questions is how these the sort of multiplicity of values and starting points that we're all coming from refuse this kind of disciplining. Maybe that's a good thing. And one of the things that we have found is, in fact, the one thing that can unite the work that we're all doing is the learning that we've derived from social movements. This kind of aspirational, I have to say, prefigurative politics of doing FPE otherwise Mo modeling that in the way that we behave to each other, modeling that in the way that, in the work that, that we try to do within often academic contexts that really push against that. I kind of bring that up a little bit because it's, um, it's kind of pertinent at the moment in the UK and possibly here as well, um, where some of the work that we're doing um, to challenge the power, power within the university sector and the whole kind of marketization of universities has meant that for many of my, myself and my colleagues have been on strike for the last, well, for, for, for several days, uh, for 40 days last year, then we're doing another sort of 40 days now. So people losing a lot of money, people losing a lot of, um, with some real impacts on well-being. but some of the things that's been really nice coming out of that and this again, I think, is pulling from some of the learnings from feminist political ecology, is the way that these new sort of ethics of care are emerging within the spirit of that particular kind of protest and how important that is in terms of sol developing solidarity with undergraduate students who are confused by the fact that their lectures appear to be cancelled and they and initially were very much pushing against the staff that they saw as being the, the root of the problem. But being able to kind of work together with students, do these teach outs, teach about social movements um, through the everyday practices of the strike has been really important. So in a way, that's a bit of bringing feminist political ecology home for me. Um, I want to turn now to um, having sort of set that up as the, the sort of new way of doing feminist political ecology that WeGo has really offered to, to me and 
with its kind of emphasis on, on solidarity politics and social movements is to come back to um, where I think what, what can end up sort of slipping through the, the gap when a lot of work is being sort of directed towards those sorts of social movement orientated prefigurative politics. And this is to kind of main make sure that we maintain and even strengthen this link with the world of gender and development which is kind of where I came into feminist political ecology from. And I feel that now more than ever, there's a real call for not losing sight of those, those kinds of connections, especially as at the moment, these international environment and development organizations are important sites for the doing of feminist political ecology. It's where a lot of feminist political ecology in sort of various forms is actually taking place. How does feminist political ecology how is feminist political ecology informing um, or even being part of the world of uh, the gender expert, in inverted commas? And how does feminist political ecology land in these technical contexts? Why that's important? Why is it important? There's this been this huge demand in a growth of demand for gender experts, for this kind of new cadre of people who are being brought into environmental organizations very much in these environment and development organizations who are struggling to kind of live up to various global norms that are in introduced through the sustainable development goals the paris agreement agenda 21 um, etc etc all of these things that have brought in this whole mandate around gender mainstreaming and this the acceleration of that is coming at a time where just when actually the, there's very powerful critiques of gender mainstreaming that we find within sort of feminist uh, feminist um, thinking and, and discussions generally. So many people, a number, number of us have been kind of questioning, well, how is, how is this happening at this time now? And particularly in uh, something that where, where I think it's relatively new is in these more technical projects around disaster risk reduction, for example, energy transitions, um, et cetera, et cetera. So some areas where you wouldn't necessarily expect to see gender experts, gender experts are being brought in. And um, it's there's a number of sort of ambivalences, I guess, associated to this institutionalization and tech, um, technocratization, if I can even say that, of feminist goals and strategies in these mainstream organizations. So I've been interested in um, kind of thinking through that, I've been on a, at a very personal level, but what's been really exciting is to kind of join forces with my old friend Bernadette Resurrection to really have take a look at this um, more carefully. So what we've tried to do is we've embraced our networks, mainly Babette's networks that uh, she has from her position with the Stockholm Environment Institute and in working with a lot of these technical organizations um, around the world, but particularly in, in Asia. Um, we've been interested in reflecting on some of the sort of shifting troubled subjectivities, taking this beyond being a kind of conversation that you might have over dinner and to kind of really have a look at, at some of these questions a little bit more carefully. Um, these really uneasy engagements, I suppose, with different kinds of uh, epistemic communities, some of which are, are quite positivist, not all, uh, but to try and unpack some of those politics of knowledge. And so what we wanted to do was to, to kind of think through this a little bit more with others, with people working at the sharp end of that. So rather than doing research on people, we actually decided to frame this very much as um, building on our sort of shared personal stake in this work and undertake this as an inquiry, a kind of collective self-reflexivity with people poised as gender experts in, in various organizations. So what we've tried to do is we uh, um, deliberated on a series of questions to ask each other. Um, we recorded our discussions. We related some of this back to contextual literature, um, re-asked questions, really came through this with a kind of collaborative reflexivity and then are beginning to kind of piece these together or we should almost have finished piecing these together as a series of polyvocal essays. Um, they're all contributors from our rooted networks and we've been using 
really kind of thinking through questions around people's personal biographies, the way they navigate expertise and authority within those, or those organizations, and how they're exploring different openings for change within those organizations. Not all of them, uh, all of the people who we spoke to have a background in feminist political ecology, some do, but, some, but many are kind of looking to feminist political ecology for, for kind of, I guess, support and help and, and thinking through some of the, the sort of things that they need to do. Now, as we, uh, we're kind of closing the, the project and we're completing the writing, um, I guess we're almost in a position to share some lessons. I don't know if I call them lessons. It sounds like we've kind of solved some problems. We really haven't. Uh, but share some, some kind of thoughts, really, on one some of the things that we've deliberated on with, with, with our contributors. And the first thing is um, that often looking at gender experts within these sorts of organizations, there are two ways of thinking about them. Um, one is as these kind of Trojan horses who can kind of sneak in some feminism, a feminist political ecology into otherwise hostile environments. Um, so that's one way of looking at it. And then another is to sort of frame these uh, gender experts as femocrats, people who have kind of gone all the way down the route of bureaucratizing gender analysis to kind of work with this, this whole sort of gender mainstreaming, rather sort of binary thinking. But what we found with um, in our conversations with each other that nobody really felt comfortable with falling into any one of those um, one of those those kinds of categories. And actually as we probed and, and sort of explored our own subjectivities in various ways, what we found was that these expert subju subjectivities are very varied. They change over time, surprise, surprise. So using some of the, the kind of tools of feminist political ecology has enabled us to kind of begin to unravel how the sort of roots into this kind of work, either through specific training on gender or via other kinds of social fields that have led people to become gender advisors. Often these roots have some play um, in, in kind of framing people's subjectivities. But then also through the ways that these subject subjectivities are, are rendered through sort of everyday practices, materialized in various kinds of ways, often through the sort of material relationships that people have within the spaces in which they're working, um, whether that's in the environmental organization itself, in the office, in workshops that people go to to kind of reinforce and perhaps kind of claim some expertise and authority in laboratories, in fieldwork contexts. And the latter was really important for people in kind of being able to bridge some of the, the to claim authority, but also bridge some of these epistemic divides that, that they were facing in these contexts. And then everyday practices around conversations, advice, advocacy, um, and how some of these sort of um, very complex subjectivities are being materialized in the tools and artifacts of gender mainstreaming as these are being kind of forged within these environmental organizations. So some really interesting interesting things that some of the contributors were sharing with us around around that as we as we continued our discussions. Um, the second kind of thing was really about, I guess, some of the ways in which these epistemological compromises shape that boundary crossing that uh, gender experts were were undertaking. So things around uh, gaining authority by erasing this boundary between epistemologies of gender and science using the language of quantitative knowledge. One of the quotes, one of, one of our uh, contributors described how somebody had rushed up to her in her organization and said, please genderize my log frame. And you can only begin to imagine what, what that might have entailed. And so some of the things around um, using some of the languages uh, and epistemologies of science were, were ways in which um, perhaps unsurprisingly gender experts were kind of being able to sort of navigate and, and claim authority within their organizations. Um, and then finally, the, uh, one of the things that we uh, noticed was that gender, uh, this was also about really claiming their own disciplinary expertise, um, not just as feminist political ecologists, but with backgrounds in things like engineering, crop science, marine biology, and so forth. Even if they hadn't started off with that kind of background, being able to kind of become uh, 
uh, converse in, in those languages was, was incredibly important. And we, we, we ended up sort of with a few um, thoughts really about how context matters. And one of the things that really pulled out for us was when we were all talking together was just how different these sorts of things play out in different kinds of environmental organisations. And one that really struck us was how organisations with a sort of history of participatory or rapid rural appraisal type work in agriculture, for example, were, were, were offered a different kind of um, landing place for feminist political ecology than things like disaster preparedness, where engineering and very top-down ways of working um, logics kind of prevailed. So I want to wrap with um, a final lesson, really, from, from this work, and just to sort of bring it all together very, very quickly. And just to say that our conversations really much, I think, reinforced to us the importance of staying with the trouble, even when these pathways for transformation remain out of reach. There's a lot of talk about, you know, being able to find openings for transformation. I don't think we found any of those, in fact, in, in the work we did. But what we did see was uh, from people sort of narrating these small changes and how important those small changes can be, just in terms of um, changing some of the workings of organisations and people, actually, in, in small ways. So critiques of gender mainstreaming are very valid and important, but I think we've got to be careful not to flatten out the complex subjectivities at work in doing feminist political ecology and to kind of ignore some of those, those spaces where feminist political ecology is, is being writ large in, in quite complicated and, and in some, some ways troubling ways. So just my last comment really is, for all of this, what we really need is kind of solidarity in troubled times, not writing, writing off areas because they don't fit with particular kinds of epistemologies. So I'll finish there, but thank you very much. All right, uh, we'll take time for questions here. Uh, so if you have a question, please put your hand up, and either Prasama or I will come to you with a mic. We have a question over here. Hello. Okay, so I noticed that you used a lot of um, Haraway's terminology for making canon the Cthulhu scene. So I was wondering, um, what type of different speculative fabulations do you conceive of for working on how to open up some more of these pathways even further still in the future? Wow. Uh, are you talking about in the context of um, these sort of organizations, environmental organizations? Correct, right, and yeah. how these kind of narrative accounts and different more imaginative accounts, as Haraway alludes to in her text, can open up further possibilities than even just epistemologically oriented um, academic works can do on their yeah. own. Um, I think there, there, is, um, there is huge scope for that, and I can think of various individuals who are really trying to do that within the organizations in which they're working. But what, what I, I think it's fair to say is in in terms of the people we were talking to in the context of this book, a lot of them were very precariously employed within those organisations. So the actual, I guess, politics of me them being able to do something as radical as that was pretty limited. And maybe this is the maybe this is really where we we need to kind of build alliances with powerful individuals within those organizations to revision and reframe. A lot are beginning to do that, but whether they're doing that along feminist lines is another matter. But that's where, I mean, I can see some of those, those possibilities opening up. And um, I think what's really important is to kind of visibilize the, that work where that's occurring and making sure that that is brought into view 
so that others can can learn from it and 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 see inspiration from it because I think it is incredibly important. But but the, these particular people, they're pretty junior. They're pretty junior and not able to do that yet. Yet is the question. All right. Uh, next question. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, there's like no, if there are no like real claims or practices that can be claimed by, or not claims, but concepts or practices that can be claimed by feminist political ecology, what do you think is the importance of having the language around it? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think the there are, I can't think of, anything necessarily that can be claimed as unique to feminist political ecology but then it really depend depends on how you're drawing a boundary around what is feminist political ecology so i i think maybe that's asking maybe i've framed it or maybe we're asking the question the wrong way it doesn't matter particularly whether you have sort of certain concepts by which your area is known it, it in some ways it shouldn't matter but i think what what tends to happen is Feminist political ecology can end up being a shorthand that obscures more than it reveals. And maybe that's wha what I'm sort of calling for is to add to that clause. I'm doing a feminist political ecology analysis that does X, Y, and Z. So it's not to say there is nothing, but it's to say that um, it, that's kind of not enough just to, just to stop there. And there's nothing to say that, I mean, in some ways, some of the concepts that have come in to feminist political ecology have been refined and developed and reworked. And I think quite a lot of things around um, socio natures, for example, owe a lot to feminist political ecology. And maybe it, that's not necessarily recognized as, as much as it could be. But, but I think that's maybe where feminist political ecology's strength is, or people working from that framing, is what they do with concepts that come from, from <coughs> other parts of feminist or any other kind of um, theoretical endeavor I is kind of bring them, work them in, in particular ways that I think then can, can carry forward into, uh, into, other, into other areas of geography or, or political ecology more broadly. Uh, any, any other questions? Thanks, thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, I, you were talking a, a little bit about social movements, a lot about uh, kind of massive social reorganizations and the kinds of really large scale changes that are, that are going on over the last couple of decades. Um, and then, but, but most of your examples actually were from uh, the domain of international organizations. I wonder if you could say something a little bit about the potentials and challenges of um, seeking solidarity between those kinds of groups? Um, uh, what are s also some of the connections across them that you've, you've, a that you've been able to come across in, in your more recent work? And um, uh, under what conditions those things might still be very difficult to kind of move forward with? Yeah, I, I mean, actually, it's I, I didn't really have time to kind of go into the, the depth and detail of, of those kinds of maneuvers in the, in the talk, but one of the things that really came through was how, you know, there are people who kind of move in and out of international organizations and social movements, and there's, there's when you sort of think about these subjectivities and the complexities, we're often talking about the same person or, or, or people who, who have that, I guess you might call it, cognitive dissonance that might occur with how we're trying to work in those different kinds of spaces. But one of the things that I think is, is interesting is how the sort of practices from one bleed into the other. And so if you kind of look at it in terms of practices, that's sometimes where some of these changes take place. So I'm thinking really around that, um, th these sort of different ways of working, the languages of care and so forth that are, that can come into 
everyday work within these big international organizations. The challenge there is them not being co-opted and turned into some big kind of human resources initiative, which happens. Uh, so in a way, those are those are the sort of challenges of pushing pushing back. But I think it kind of works the other way as well. And and I mean, others have written about this a lot uh, about how the sort of professionalization of s social movements sometimes mimics the work of those international organizations so that in order to kind of make effective, but at the same time, in some instances, render technical some of the things that, that are that are obviously potentially undermining the, the, the original spirit in which that, that kind of movement was intended to work. But yeah, it's I, I don't think there's a, an easy answer about that. And but a lot of the, the people who we spoke to gave examples of how they'd sort of moved in and between those spaces. Not everyone. There are certainly the sort of career development workers who, who've never worked outside of that. But a lot a lot of them, a lot of people, it's it's much more fluid and complex than that. Uh, and particularly, I think with with feminist uh, these sort of gender experts, who none of whom wanted to be called that, by the way, they didn't like that terminology at all. Uh, some claimed it, a lot refused it. But uh, I think that says a lot about the, the that kind of bleeding between those two spaces of of of, of change, really. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Hi, thank you so much for uh, speaking to us today. So um, in thinking about a few years ago, uh, Ingrid Nelson and Wendy Harcourt released their edited book on feminist political ecologies. And I, if I recall correctly, the last chapter was a conversation between Wendy Harcourt, Tara Tabasi, and I think one other scholar on uh, queering feminist political ecology. So. Um, my question for you is how have or have queer ecologies influenced feminist political ecology in Europe or in your work with international development organizations? Yeah, I, um, well, Wendy, Wendy is the kind of principal investigator for this WeGo network, so it's very much been that the idea of sort of queering has very much been a focus, I think, for for some of the work going on within within that, I think, in terms of international working with international organisations, it's that's a really up, that's a really uphill way of working. I mean, for all the the kind of ways in which this very kind of binary idea around gender is is constantly being reinforced and and re re kind of re strengthened and in really kind of unhelpful ways within international development is not something that uh, it's something that needs constant challenge and it's not something that I think any of the the people that we were that we were talking to in the context of this study were finding very easy to to deal with and particularly um, I think that there's some research being done in in European context particularly around the European Union trying to bring uh, much more strongly a, a kind of uh, critique of of gender mainstreaming in a way that 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 kind of reinforces those those sorts of boundaries so from that that particular angle on on queer thinking is is something that I think is not um, not been particularly well well done I think in in terms of these international organizations at least that, that we were working with and um, all the people wor working within those organizations who are our, our contributors and I think in terms of um, the some of the the kind of challenges that that Wendy was talking about in that in that final chapter are things that are ongoing ongoing projects really and and ones that one of the, the things that I think is is particularly heartening is to see how those ideas are being picked up and, and developed and, and thought about in these spaces that are generating the, the kind of development folks of the future. So Wendy's based at, at the uh, at ISS in the Netherlands, for example, with this kind of mandate for training development people. So I think the politics lies a lot in the in the pedagogy as as well as in in, ev in every other in every other sphere. But but I guess what 
what would worry me or what worries me in terms of thinking about how how that gains purchase in these international institutions is I, I think it's it doesn't it hasn't it's yet um in certainly the ones that i'm familiar with but there may be other others in the audience who are working on this kind of thing that that would be able to to say differently and i hope and i hope so but certainly that was what what i was what babette and i were observing in our in our conversations with with people was this was really a long a long road that that perhaps wasn't wasn't um being traveled very at a very fast rate in in within the certainly within these sort of very technical organizations apart from a, a very sort of interpersonal level that's that's different but in terms of changing practice and working with ideas around gender that that was in some ways quite conservative great uh, if we can go ahead and thank um, dr elmhurst